Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is uh, such, a, such a pleasure, such an honor to be here. I bring greetings from the great state of California. Yeah, that helps. And uh, <laughs> I, I know what you're thinking. I thought it too. The scripture says, can anything good come out of California? And, uh, but please don't feel bad for myself or my wife, for we, we've always dreamed of living in a foreign country. And um, I just want to say what an incredible honor it is to uh, be with, with all of you uh, and to be in this pulpit on, on this campus on this day. It is, a, uh, it is truly a ministry highlight for me personally. Uh, my wife and I are, are so grateful for the friendship with, um, with Al and Mary. Um, before I met Dr. Moeller, I kept thinking, how does, how does this guy accomplish all that he does? President, author, speaker, podcast, writer. And then I met Mary. And I realized how he does that, the steady hand and faithful support uh, to him. Uh, well, people, I come to you uh, here this morning. I come not as a professor or, or a scholar, but I do come as a preacher and a shepherd. And this morning, I, I want to open up the scriptures with just a brief time with you. And so, if you love Jesus, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And I want to read a, a section here, and, um, and then we're going to narrow it in from there. But let me read from Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse, well, just the tail end of verse 18 down to 24. The Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is, my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but now, or but with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to part and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is, well, it's more necessary on your account. A quick word of prayer. Father, we pray as we we open up the book of the Lord that you would show us the Lord of the book. We're keenly aware this morning, Lord, that the messenger is nothing and the message is everything. And so speak the word of life, the word of truth into our hearts and our minds here this morning. We pray this in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Does the name Roger Bannister ring a bell to you? Roger Bannister was the first human to ever break the four minute mile. Humans had always wanted to run a mile in four minutes or less, but they were never able to accomplish it. The Greeks in particular were always trying. In fact, they would feed their runners uh, tiger's milk. Uh, that didn't seem to help. And so they eventually just let the tigers out. And that, that sped up the process a little bit for sure. <laughs> but nobody could actually break a, a four minute mile. That was until May 6, 1954, Oxford, England, where Roger Bannister hit the tape at three minutes, 59.4 seconds, and the world went crazy in that moment. What I find interesting to me is not that Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, was that the very next year in 1955, 37 guys broke the four minute mile. And a year after that in 1956, over 300 men broke the four minute mile. And, and now it seems like everybody except me can run a four minute mile. I will tell you this, I think there is something in our humanness, something the way God has designed us, that when we, we see someone else, uh, the ability to accomplish an incredible goal, an incredible feat, that we are inspired ourselves to do the very same thing. I say this to you this morning because the Apostle Paul is my personal Roger Bannister. Uh, here's a man who, uh, I would argue, kicked a dent in eternity. He kicked a massive dent in eternity. In fact, there's a good chance that your spiritual heritage, my spiritual her heritage, leads back to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. 
And I realized that if, if Paul, if Paul can kick a dent in eternity, that means you and I got a shot at it too. And so I, I come here the, the, this morning uh, not worried about whether any of us in this room is going to be successful. My, my concern is simply that you might be successful at the wrong things. And to kick a dent in eternity means that we got to make sure we're doing the right things. And so this morning, if I was to give a title to the message, it would, it would be a, it, to kick a dent in eternity. Uh, it, it's reminiscent to me of the 18th century uh, preacher, John Wesley, when he wrote to a fellow believer and he said these words, give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin, desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw, whether they be clergymen or laymen, such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Oh man, that fires me up. And this morning, I want you to see a very simple kind of foundational purpose, a foundational ground that the apostle Paul, in my estimation, stood on for his entire life and ministry. I'm going to ask you to focus in on a very dangerous verse, a very dangerous verse because it's dangerous because it's very familiar and it's tucked away there in verse 21, uh, in chapter one of Philippians, Philippians 1 21. And, and he simply says this, he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is what's that word? Or do we not talk here to die is what? His gain is the gain. I, I believe this is the foundation in which he launched his, his dent-kicking life. And, and, and the scary part is familiar things can become overlooked things. And, and I've flown from California here this morning. I, I'm not here to tell you things you don't know, but I am here to remind you of a few things that you should never forget. And for Paul, it was boiled down in this one foundational statement, for to me, to live is Christ and die is gain. I want us to look at these 12 English words, nine Greek words, uh, that were penned by this Jewish lawyer turned Christian evangelist. Remember the setting, he's, he's not uh, basking in the Mediterranean by any means. The apostle Paul is incarcerated in Rome. And while he's incarcerated, he, he decides he's going to publish a number of books. We, we know these as the prison epistles. And he writes this, this very personal, very intimate letter to this beloved church there in Philippi that he loved. Remember, remember the purple lady, Lydia and the brothers. And in chapter one, he opens up with his love for this, this, this church. And he, he, he just prays his heart out in chapter one there at the beginning for this beloved church. And this church is worried about Paul. So they, they send this elder, most likely Epaphrodites, all the way over to see Paul and bring him some refreshments. And Epaphrodites gets get sick. And now Philippi is, is worried about Paul, Epaphrodites, and Paul's worried about, about uh, Philippi. And everybody is kind of uh, concerned about each other. And at the moment that we, we read this, and in the moment that he wrote this, we, we don't know whether Paul is going to get out of prison alive. We now know that uh, in history, looking back, he does. But but I'll tell you, if I'm going to write a book, you're going to write a book while you're incarcerated. I'm not sure I'm going to write some of the books that he wrote. I, I'm probably going to write some, I'm going to write some letters about the evils of the Roman government, the bad prison conditions. But, but, but he pins a letter and this is what just, this is what just kills me on this. He writes a letter and he picks a topic to write about. And the topic is Quran, what the Greeks refer to as joy. Uh, and and for, for, for this Christian joy that he talks about in every single chapter in Philippians, it's not about joy. It's not about a, a bad case of the giggles. No, no joy, joy is this defiant joy that, that Paul's talking about. And so what he, he describes what joy, if you were to take all of the chapters together, I would argue that biblical joy is a deep down settled confidence that God is in control of every detail of your life. Did you hear that? Biblical joy is the deep down settled confidence that God is in control of every detail of your life. 
And it's because of this defiant joy, I believe this one man turned the world upside down for Christ. And I don't know about you, I don't wanna spend my short time here on earth just sucking oxygen and leaving a carbon footprint. I wanna kick a dent in eternity. I wanna make, make my life purposeful. I want it to count for Christ. And, and so this morning, I wanna give you four in really rapid fire here, four things from this verse that I think are, frankly, the foundational freedom in which Paul conducted his entire ministry. Oh, we'll write this for a first phrase down, this idea of personal choice. Personal choice. Notice, notice, notice the first few words here. For, for to, to me to live is Christ and die is gain. But he starts with those first three words, depending on your translation, for to me, for to me. He's very clear that he's saying, he's saying much like Joshua stood in Joshua 24 before the, the nation of, of Israel there, and he says, but as for me and my house, oh, let me tell you, we're gonna serve the Lord. Paul says the same thing here, for, for to me. He's not, he's not putting it on the church of Philippi. He's not, a, he's not making sure Epaphroditus uh, uh, agrees with this. He says, for to me to live is Christ. Loved ones, hear me this morning on this. Hear me on this morning. Christianity, godliness, walking and following Jesus Christ 24-7, let me just tell you, is a personal choice of yours. Nobody can make it for you. It's a, it's a stiff spine conviction that I'm going to spend my life connected to Christ and Christ alone. Christianity is not caught. Christianity is, doesn't come down to your genes, or hereditary. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, a very godly Christian home. Everything was Christian. We had, we had Christian carpet, Christian landscaping, Christian dogs. The cat was an uncircumcised Philistine. But, 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 but the, reality, the reality is everything was Christianese around me, but I didn't get that from my parents. You see, following Christ is a personal decision. And here you are at a, a Bible college, a Bible seminary, but let me just tell you, every day is a choice to say, I choose to follow Christ today. And Paul says, it, it's a me thing, for to me. And what's interesting is interesting, he personalizes this choice. And he says, I don't know what you're thinking in Philippi, but for to me is to live as Christ and to die as gain. You have to own your own walk, people. I, I, I don't know about you. I, I don't know if you're here seeking, if you're here seeking a degree for someone else's dream. Or are you pursuing, are you pursuing a personal, holy calling of God on your life? It's time to walk your own walk. It's time to, that you own your own devotion to Christ and Christ alone. You say, why well, I, I did that back in, I did that back in uh, high school. I did that in junior high, element. No, I'm talking about today and tomorrow. I think Paul woke up every day and for, for to me to live as Christ. And I gotta, man, I gotta get rid of the training wheels that I grew up with, of the, the Christian heritage that I come from. I remember the day my dad came home and he said, Todd, today's the day. And I said, what dad, What's, what is today? He says, today's the day you're gonna ride your bike without training wheels. So there we are out in the garage and he takes off the training wheels and there he uh, comes. You probably had the same experience of all of a sudden he's running behind me, I'm pedaling. And then all of a sudden my dad lets go of, the, uh, of, of that bike and there I am kind of wobble we weeble and I am now riding, I am, I am riding my own bike all by myself at 19. And I was so, <laughs> I, and I was so excited. But here, 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 Christ follower, hear me on this. For some of you, maybe in this room, you need to hear this this morning. You need to take the training wheels off. You need to make sure that you're here pursuing higher education for, for, for to me to live as Christ. See, following Christ is a me, a me thing. Following Christ means that you're fully mortgaged, that you, 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 you have no equity 
You, you just say, man, I'm all in for Christ. That's, is this not rem, reminiscent of Romans chapter 12, verse one, when Paul says, I urge you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, watch this, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Aren't you glad he said living? He says, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What I find fascinating is, is that Greek verb, uh, present. Paul puts it in the eritus tense, meaning this, it's a one-time act in the past that has this continuing result. In essence, what Paul just said to all of us in this room, once and for all, make up your mind for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Number two, write this down, not just personal choice, but personal conduct, personal conduct. He says this, for, for, for to me, to live, that's, that's the key phrase, for, for to me, to live is Christ and die is gain. I, I, I will remind you as you move on from, from this campus someday, following Jesus is a active following. It is not a, a passive life. It's, it's a life that is to be lived out. And Paul understood this. Why? Well, think about it. In history, the Greeks were known as thinkers. They were thinkers. They had a people, educational, philosophy. Uh, the Romans, what were they? They were builders by nature. They built everything. They built the world. They built Roman roads. You can still walk on them. And the Jews, what were they? They were doers. They were doers. That's why they loved the law. I love the law. It gives me something to do. And in fact, I want more things to do. Give me more law. And so Paul has this Jewish heritage and he's reminding us the gospel is, is not some type of just static reality. No, it's in what you do. Notice what he doesn't say in this verse. He doesn't say, for to me it is to study. For, for to me is to attend. For to me is to memorize. No, he says, for, for to me is to live. To live a life 24-7, 365. That's why the half-brother of Jesus, remember, he says, don't be merely a, a hearer of God's word, but be an effectual doer of God's word. And then watch this. He says, and you'll be blessed in what you do. He knew, he knew that's where the blessing came from. I, you know, I, we have three, three expensive kids and, and, they, and, and, and when they were young, I, I would say, I'd say, Luke, go clean your room. And 10 minutes go by, I don't hear a lot going on up there. So I go upstairs, I look in, in the room and there's, there's my son, Luke, and he's sitting down in a, in a circle and they have books and they have notebooks. And I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, we're having a little Bible study of what it means to go clean your room. Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means go clean your room. He says, well, actually, dad, you know, we're parsing that verb right now, go clean. And Tony over here is trying to explain what it means to him to go clean your room. I don't care what Tony says, I want you to what? I want you to go clean your room. I, I want you to live out the, the command that the Father has given to us. I, uh, the idea is that obedience, hear me on this, obedience is the love language of God. How does the Father feel loved? He says it's, it's, by, it's by doing, it's about living this, this, this Christianity out. That's why in chapter two, he talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, just live this, this, this ethic out of, of following Christ. And he says, start with humility. I mean, the first thing you do living it out is that of humility. Work out your salvation. That's why, loved ones, hear me, dent kickers, dent kickers, they're, they're light bearers. They, they, they understand Jesus when Jesus said in Matthew 5, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. So go live it out. And let's face it, we got, we're in some dark, dark times for sure. Very dark times. When my first grandson was born, uh, just a few years ago, everybody kept coming up to me. Oh, Pastor Todd, it's so sad, so sad. That little cow was born at this time. So dark out there. And I said, no, it's not. He was born for such a time as this. He's going to be the Daniel. He's going to be, he's going to be the Moses. He's going to be the Abraham. My, my granddaughters are going to be the Esthers of this world. Now is the time for them to live out their, 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 their Christian life. Loved ones, I will remind you, living out your Christian life is, is the easiest on campus in that church. 
But as you move into professions, whether you're a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker, the scripture says you do it all to the glory of God. Why? Because it's a personal choice for to me to live this faith out. That's why, that's why Paul had a, had a long obedience. Is, is, is he understood he could trust. He could trust Christ. He, he could live it out even to his own detriment. He, he could follow Jesus in the calm and in the chaos. Notice, notice chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. He says, as I live out, in essence, paraphrase, as I live out my trial, prison. Notice this. He says, know that it is a blessing according to Paul. It's not, some of you are not in the calm, but you're in the chaos. And you are reminded this morning that the, the apostle Paul says, even in the chaos, you live out your faith. You can trust him. Well, you don't understand, pastor. Pastor. I got, a, I got a better way, I got a better idea than this chaos. Well, I invite you to remember the, the radio Bible teacher, J. Vernon McGee. He was the one who rightfully said, this is God's universe and he does things his way. You may have a better way, but you do not have a universe. <laughs> the reality is, is even in the chaos, I trust Christ. I, I trust him to follow him 24-7, 365, every moment of the day. Remember, remember what Jesus, Jesus did with the disciples? One of the key things he did, so sometime read through the gospels and circle the word every time you get to this phrase, Jesus was with the disciples. I've always wanted to do a study of witness, witness theology if you could. What is it? the promise of, of Christ is I will be with you always. Both in the calm and the chaos, you live it out. It's a daily thing. That, that, that brings comfort and conviction. It brings comfort that Jesus was with his disciples. He's with us. I can be a witness for him. I can live this out even to my own detriment. It's also conviction. Man, man I, the Lord's watching. I'm living this out in front of him. You know, every time you sit down to uh, take the exam in, in, in class, you know, do you do, you, do, you do it with egr uh, integrity? Because there's a witness going on. I live this out 24 seven, even during this exam, even as I'm about to take the exam and I'm praying to the Lord, Lord, please bring to mind things I've never studied. <laughs> even when it's time to write the paper in that chat GPT, is flashing at you saying, I can write it, I can write it, I can write it. You see, living, living out your faith is a daily thing. Number three, write this down. It's not only a personal choice, it's not only personal conduct, but number three, number three, you guys still with me this morning? Can I get an amen if you're still with me this morning? Amen. All right, all six of you, great. Uh, personal confidence. What you see in this statement is personal confidence, not in self though. He says this, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Loved ones, let me, let me be very clear, abundantly clear. Dent kickers have a personal confidence in Christ and Christ alone. Life is coming at you and me at the same speed, 60 seconds a minute. And man, it is easy in life coming that fast to put your ladder up against the wrong wall. And Paul says, you know what, for me to live and, and my confidence is simply in Christ and Christ alone. What's interesting, in the original Greek, there, there is no verb is in the Greek. This is, so if you were just to read it as, as Paul wrote it, he, he said it this way, for, for to me to live Christ. You feel the blunt force of that statement? For me to live, what is it, Paul? Christ. That, that's who I live for. Uh, that, that not for self. We, we live in a generation, we're the only generation that stands in front of the Grand Canyon and takes selfies. Like really, the, the hole in the ground's not, you wanna be in it, not this big hole? Well, yeah, because I, I wanna make sure everybody can see that I was at the Grand Canyon and see myself. Just look at our magazines over the years. It's told the story of human nature. Life magazine started in 1883, life, it's all about life. Then they said, no, it's, 
it's really big, it's really a smaller group. It's, it's really about people. People Magazine came out in 1923. Oh, everybody's people, but you know what? That's still too big of a group. So in 1977, Us Magazine came out. It's really about us. It wasn't, it wasn't more than two years later that that magazine came out called Self. What you saw is the progression of, of, of pompous pride in our hearts. I'm confident in myself. Paul says, I'm not confident in myself. He says, everything I live for is Christ. Everything I am is Christ. He told the church at Colossae in Colossians 3, 4, he says, Christ is our life. He, he's everything to me. It reminds me of that great hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust in the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground, all other ground, all other ground is seeking, sinking sand. You know who wrote that? It was written by Edward Moat. He became a Baptist preacher at a Baptist church in Horsham, England. He took over the church really as a second career. He actually built the church, physically built the building. And at age 55, he became the, the pastor there at, at the strict Baptist church in Horsham, England. In fact, out of gratitude, the people were so grateful for what he did. He built the church and now he's, now he's gonna pastor it. Out of gratitude, the congregation offered to give him the deed to the property. You know what his response was? He says, I do not want the chapel. I only want the pulpit. And when I cease to praise Christ, then turn me out of that. He understood something. For me to live is Christ. This world has nothing to offer me, but Christ does. That's why in Romans 8, 29, remember we're being conformed to the image of who? Christ. We're not being conformed to the image of the Father. We're not being conformed to the image of the Spirit. We're being conformed to the image of Christ. Why, why, why Christ? Why, why, why are we conformed to that image? Because Christ was the one who could please the Father. Two times the clouds were parted and God the Father said, this is my son in whom I am well. What's the word? Pleased. He knows how to please the Father. So, 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 so here's the reality here. Here's the reality is, is I, 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 want, I, I want to make sure that I'm living fully and only for the cause of Christ. Paul had no competing loyalties. He had no other agenda. The entire reason for his life, the entire reason for existence on earth, the entire reason for which Paul lived, the entire reason in which Paul preached, the entire reason for which he traveled and was in prison was for, could be reduced down to this one statement, for to me to live is Christ. As Piper would say, it's the preciousness of Christ. If I was to write this sentence, if you were to write this sentence, we could fill in all kinds of words. For to me to live, for, 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 for to me to live is, is money, is fitness, pickleball, politics. You know we have an election in a couple weeks? You heard of that? Remember this, remember this. This is a side note, this is just free from California. It's more important who is in your house than who is in the White House. Paul understood that. That's why he said, for to me to live is Christ. That's a, that's a for and a by statement. It's a target and an empowerment. Why? Because the heart, man, as Calvin says, is an idol factory. I can have many reasons to live. I, I can have many things that I'm living for, but Paul says it's only for, for Christ. Why? Because he, he, he died your death so that you and I could live his life. He'll go on in chapter three and he says, I, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, there's one thing I do. Paul doesn't say these 34 things I dabble in. There's one thing I do, I press on. Fourth and finally, I finish with this. It's not only personal choice, personal conduct, and personal confidence, but, 
Notice the personal certainty here. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And to die is gain. Let me just tell you, the only word that works where the outcome can be that death is gain is the word Christ. For to me, to live is Christ. If it was for, for to me to live is money, die is not gain. For to me to live is, is fitness, well, that's definitely not a gain of death. The only word that, that makes absolute sense is, is Christ. Why? Because he's conquered sin and death. Let me just tell you, loved ones, when they took Jesus and they spread him wide and they hung him high, and when Christ took his last breath on that cross, I'll tell you this, Satan gasped for air because in that moment he was suffocated to death so that Paul could say, and to die is to gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's why he says there going on in verse 23, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart to be with you. For that, to be, to be with Christ, for that is far, that is far better. I often tell our church, the day you die is the greatest day of your life. It's the greatest day of your life. I'm not talking about how you die. I want to die on the beach in Maui, but, but, but it doesn't, it, it's not the how I die. Is if, our, if we really believe what Paul's saying here, then to die is gain. Who says that? Someone who is filled and intoxicated with the hope of the gospel. That's who says that. To, 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 to die is to gain. Death for the believer is the greatest pleasure, the greatest satisfaction, the, the greatest euphoric joy for all of eternity. And loved ones, those, those four things, personal choice, personal conduct, personal confidence, personal certainty, let me just tell you, loved ones, that is what fires me up and gives me a rabid passion to follow Jesus Christ, not just on Sundays with my church, but to follow him on Wednesday mornings and Tuesday afternoons. For the worst thing this life can do is take my life, and for me, that's the greatest gain there is. Though, though it seems like yesterday it was not. Uh, that is the day that my father experienced his gain. And I remember holding his hand as he took that first breath of that rarefied celestial air. And... Um, he was a godly man. He lived out this statement for me. But since, since his passing, I, I, I took his wallet. This is my dad's wallet. And I keep it, um, I, keep it in my, I keep it in my sock drawer to remind me everything this wallet represents is here on earth. House address, banking information, account balances, membership clubs. And it reminds me every day, Todd, look, your father did not take his wallet with him and neither will you. And the great gain he experienced is simply because he understood to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we're thankful for your word to us. You have spoken clearly and you have not stuttered. And I pray, Lord, what would be the lasting effect is really those really six words, to me, to live is Christ. To me, to live is Christ. May those six words resonate and ring in our ears even around five o'clock this afternoon. We pray all of this in your precious and holy name, the name of Jesus Christ, amen.